Hello everyone and good morning. Okay. Hello po, good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. So, good morning everyone and welcome to the launch of the Environmental Law Teachers Online Training Program. This training program is developed by the Legal Education Board in partnership with the Asian Development Bank, ADB, International Union of Conservation of Nature, Academy of Environmental Law, and the UN Environment Program. I am Attorney Maria Romina B. Kumal, Program Coordinator of the Legal Education Board, and I will be your host today. Before we get started, um, I would like to announce our house rules for the, today's event. So reminders to all of our participants, please let us know if we could record this session today. We will only start recording if all participants consent to the recording. Mute always your microphone while waiting for others to join in and, one not, and when not speaking in the session. Use the chat box option if you have any questions or comment or click the react button to interact with our speakers and judges. So I am glad to um, announce that we have, at, we have 70 participants to our training program today. Before we get started, <clears throat> let's have, um, okay. Before we get started, I would like to um, announce to you the program details of the lunch event today. So we will start with the introduction, the prayer, the national anthem, message from the legal education chairperson, message from the ATB general counsel, an inspirational message from Chief Justice Renato Puno, a message from the UN Environment Program, a message from UIN, IUCN Academy of Environmental Law, and a message from an environmental law faculty. After that, we will have a short overview and short presentation from our resource speaker for today. I will also introduce to you and announce to you the training objectives and schedule. And after that, we will have a message from attorney Antonio Oposa. We will also have a wellness break which, which would take around 10 minutes. So we will just announce it later. And then after that, we will proceed to the part two of this um, session. So we will have a discussion on the modern curriculum and a question and answer portion to, to engage you, our participants, to our resource speaker, and lastly, our feedback and the closing remarks from one of the Legal Education Board Commissioner. Okay, let's begin with a short prayer. Our Heavenly Father, the fount of all goodness and grace, because of wisdom, the source of intelligence, we welcome you, O Lord, to this auspicious gathering of your beloved, who continuously give you thanks for every opportunity to learn something new and become fruitful to the works of your creation. We humbly come to you, not because we are worthy, but because we find ourselves in need of you, who is our strength and our hope, to continue despite the challenges we face in health, prosperity, and our solidarity with one another. We pray that today's gathering made possible by the grace of advancements in technology and social media, become successful in its endeavors so we can offer it back to you as our humble offering to honor you, glorify you, and love you through our deeper connection with everyone. May we find bliss in today's session and become more productive children and co-creators of the earth. This we ask and pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Now, for attendance purposes, we would like to request everyone to turn on their video camera and wear their best smile for a quick picture. Our ADB colleagues will be taking the photo. So everyone, um, one, two, three, smile. Just like to request everyone to keep that pose for a while because uh, we have many participants, so it'll be um, multiple screens to go through. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Wait, hold on. More. On, please. Lads, can you uh, can you take a screenshot of uh, of everybody, please? Uh, Gladys. Glad did you get did you get everybody? Okay. Um, others are joining in, so I'm just trying to capture everyone. One more. Okay. Just hold yeah, your poses, right. please. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. All right. I guess it's true when they say that a smile is always the best way to welcome your morning. So good morning again, everyone. So let's now proceed to the program. So we'll play the national anthem. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. formally start our program, we, will, we are joined today to give the welcome message. The newly appointed chairman of the Legal Education Board, Attorney Anna Marie Melanie Trinidad. Uh, okay, I guess um, Chair Melanie is not yet around. So let's hear first a message from our partner institution, Asian Development Bank. Let's welcome General Counsel of ADB, Mr. Mr. Thomas Clark. Magandang umaga. Good morning to everyone. And thank you very much for the pleasure and opportunity for me to be here. Legal Education Board Chair Ana Marie Melanie Bacani Trinidad, former Chief Justice Renato Puno, Commissioner Jojo Sereratai, 
Professors Rose Lisa Osorio and Galahad Pe Benito, Dr. Georgina Lloyd from the UNEP, and all other environmental law teachers and scholars joining us today. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to welcome you to the launch of the Philippine Environmental Law Teachers Training Program, which supports the Legal Education Board's revised model law curriculum of the basic law program. The revised model law curriculum now provides for the mandatory teaching of environmental and natural resources law in all Philippines law schools. This major milestone for legal education in the Philippines and will be further strengthened by a model environmental law syllabus to be developed early next year and related training programs. The Asian Development Bank commends the Legal Education Board for its leadership in reforming and modernizing the country's environmental legal education, which stands to benefit greatly current and future generations. And we are delighted to partner with the LEB on this critical initiative, along with the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law and United Nations Environmental Program. I'm very excited about the possibilities of what we are starting right here. This LEB initiative is a very timely response to the increasing environmental and climate challenges facing the Philippines. Its irreplaceable unique ecosystems, food, water, and energy security, and the safety and livelihood of millions, particularly the poor, have been under threat. The COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated these challenges and has led to a surge in plastic and medical waste and unfortunately a rise in wildlife poaching, illegal fishing, logging and mining due to reduced monitoring and enforcement. To help address these serious issues in the Philippines and indeed in the rest of the Asia and the Pacific region, ADB has redoubled our efforts using more of our financing and resources to improve environmental protection, tackle climate change, and enhance disaster resilience. For example, ADB assists our client countries by providing financing for their sustainable development projects, investing in green companies, providing policy advice and capacity building, and even improving our own policies as you may know, ADB is in the process of updating our energy policy, safeguards policy, and disaster and emergency assistance policy. Likewise, I'm particularly proud to say that at ADB's Office of the General Counsel, our law and policy reform program, led by Christina, my colleague, has been focusing more on legal reforms and capacity building to enhance environmental sustainability and climate change mitigation and adaptation measures. For example, we have been assisting governments to enact framework climate change laws, sectoral laws such as renewable energy and disaster management laws, and working with legal and judicial stakeholders to build their capacity in implementing these reforms and increasing their knowledge of sustainable development issues. Under our law and policy reform program, our flagship, one flagship program is our Developing Environmental Law Champions Program, which has been working to improve environmental and climate change legal education and teaching capacity in Asia and the Pacific region, as well as supporting a growing network of environmental law champions, comprising over 380 environmental law educators from over 250 institutions across 14 countries in Asia and the Pacific. ADB considers strengthening the capacity of environmental law educators an urgent priority. We all know that education is the foundation and developing a green mindset starts in the classroom with teachers that inspire. Importantly, environmental law educators are responsible for creating the next pipeline of law practitioners civil servants, policymakers, and judges who will influence sustainability outcomes. At the same time, 
environmental law educators serve as crucial resources and trainers to government, judiciary, businesses, NGOs, and indigenous communities. If the legal education system lacks the capacity and resources, unfortunately, sustainable development outcomes will be compromised. So as part of the solution, ADBs started the Developing Environmental Law Champions Program in 2015. The program began with a train the trainer program involving 57 senior professors from 14 countries, including the Philippines, who came together with the goal of improving teaching capacity of environmental law professors and lecturers. And they have delivered on their commitment and have done so much since then. These environmental law champions have led their own in-country training programs, helped improve environmental law curriculum in their institutions and countries, helped make environmental law a core subject and contributed to in-country and regional knowledge sharing events. It has truly been so inspiring for us to support such dedicated environmental law teachers, scholars, and lawyers. Yes, even lawyers can be good guys. In particular, I would like to recognize the great efforts of our Philippines environmental law champions, professors and attorneys Rose Lisa Isma Osorio, Gloria Gali Ramos, and Gerthi Mayo Anda, part of the original cohort of senior professors who convened in 2015 and helped grow the Developing Environmental Law Champions Program. ADB truly looks forward to supporting the LEB and all of you to strengthen environmental law, legal education, and teaching capacity in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your strong commitment. Again, congratulations on the launch of this training program. I hope that this program produces more and more champions for the environment and truly goes from strength to strength. Maraming salamat po. Thank you all very much for your attention and have a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that very warm, warm welcome to our participants and to our guests. Now, to share with us his words of inspiration, we are honored to have with us today a great environmental advocate. He is a graduate of UP Law in 1962 and finished his Master's of Comparative Laws in Southern Medicine. Methodist University, Dallas, Texas, USA. He is also a holder of Masters of Law in University of California, USA, and has finished all academic requirements of the degree of Doctor of Juridical Science in University of Illinois, Combina, USA, in 1969. He is also awarded the Honoris Causa on Doctor of Humanities by the Philippine Wesleyan University in April 1994 and Doctors of Laws Honoris Causa confirmed by Angeles University Foundation, among other great honorary awards. He is also chosen as one of the 10 outstanding young men of the Philippines in the field of law in 1977, a bar examiner a recipient order of the Candula Award Bayani in Malacanang Palace on June 12, 2010, and a recipient of Service of Humanity Awards given by the Centrist Asia Pacific Democrats International and the Royal Academy of Cambodia on September 19, 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 22nd Chief Justice of the Philippines, Honorable Renato Puno. Thank you, Attorney uh, Gumal, for uh, the gracious uh, introduction. Let me uh, skip the uh, usual uh, salutations in uh, the interest of time. But uh, let me just uh, greet uh, all the uh, participants in uh, the launching of uh, this uh, project, the uh, Environmental uh, Law Teachers Online uh, Training uh, Program. Uh, <clears throat> my friends, ladies and uh, gentlemen, at uh, the outset, let me uh, congratulate 
the Legal uh, Education Board, led by uh, its uh, new chairperson, the Honorable uh, Anna Marie Melanie Trinidad, as well as the uh, Asian uh, Development Bank and uh, the, the uh, International uh, Union for uh, the Conservation of Nature for uh, launching uh, this uh, environmental uh, law teachers online uh, training uh, program. You know, at uh, the start of uh, the 21st century, a uh, gathering of uh, scholars from uh, various intellectual uh, disciplines listed uh, the following problems as uh, the most uh, urgent that uh, will confront mankind. One, uh, global warming. Two, excessive population growth. Three, water shortages. Four, destruction of life in the ocean. Five, mass famines in uh, ill organized countries. Six, the spread of deserts. Seven, pandemics. Eight, extreme poverty. Nine, the growth of shanty cities. 10, unstoppable global migration. 11, new state actors with uh, extreme weapons of mass destruction. 12, violent religious extremism. 13, runaway computer intelligence. And last, a war that could end civilization. A top view of uh, these problems will uh, reveal that almost all are directly or indirectly related to mankind's failure to find the correct balance between the need to preserve our environment and uh, the necessity to uh, exploit it, to sustain uh, economic progress. This uh, collision of two valid interests has ceased to be the mere parochial concerns of states for their political, social, and economic impacts. Crisscross the national boundaries of nations and affect international peace, order, and security. For this uh, reason, we see in the last decades, state governments, regional governments, and uh, the United Nations itself crafting national laws, regional and uh, international protocols on uh, the management of our marine resources, water resources, fisheries resources, biodiversity resources, 
air pollution, hazardous and radioactive waste, as well as the correct relationship between trade and environment. The importance of uh, these new legal regimes <clears throat> resulting from these fast-growing protocols cannot be overemphasized. For they are nothing less determinative of the mother of all our human rights, our right to life itself. Prescinding from uh, this uh, premise, it uh, ought to follow that it is our bounden duty to uh, develop a uh, familiarity of our environmental laws and to develop a grasp of uh, their emerging emanations. And it is our duty to impart their knowledge, not only to uh, students of uh, environmental laws, but to all our citizenry, including the policy makers of government. This is not a matter where we have the luxury of time to hem and to how. Next month, the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as uh, COP26, will open in uh, Glasgow, England. A few days ago, the United Nations uh, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, warned that there will be, and I quote, catastrophic consequences for people and the planet on which we depend, unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. But more than its legal and political dimensions, it is its ethical and moral aspects. And this is well expressed by the joint statement issued a few days ago by the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and uh, the Anglican Church, the world's largest, second largest, and the third largest Christian groups. And let me quote uh, their uh, a statement. The statement partly reads, the current climate crisis speaks volumes about who we are and how we view and treat God's creation. We stand before a harsh justice, biodiversity loss, environmental degradation, 
and climate change are the inevitable consequences of our actions. Since we have greedily consumed more of the Earth's resources than the planet can endure. And then they can concluded, and again I quote, all of us, whoever and wherever we are, can play a part in changing our collective response to the unprecedented threat of climate change and environmental degradation. Caring for God's creation is a spiritual commission requiring a response of commitment. This is a critical moment. Our children's future and the future of our common home depend on it. End of a statement. My friends, I leave this statement as food for thought. And good day to all of you. Thank you, Chief Justice Renato Puno, for your very inspiring words. It is, it is our, our, we appreciate all your kindness and your presence today. Join us in this event. Now we would like to award you with the plaque of appreciation from the Legal Education Board. So, this plaque of appreciation is given to Chief Justice Renato S. Puno, retired 22nd Chief Justice of the Philippines, Supreme Court of the Philippines. In grateful recognition and commendation for the inspiration he has provided as guest speaker. If I may read, since uh, Mary, I think, has connectivity issue. So in uh, this award of this plaque of appreciation is awarded to Chief Justice Renato S. Puno, retired Supreme Court Chief Justice of the Philippines, our 22nd Chief Justice of the Philippines, of the Supreme Court of the Philippines, in grateful recognition and commendation for the inspiration he has provided as guest speaker during the launching ceremony of the Environmental Law Teachers Online Training Program held via Zoom virtual conference given this 22nd day of September in the year of our Lord 2021 in Manila by our chairperson of the Legal Education Board, the Honorable Anna Marie Melanie B. Trinidad. Chief Justice Puno, thank you very much for reminding us of our duty as law professors to know our environmental laws and to impart this not just to our students, but to the citizenry and the policymakers. Thank you, CJ. God bless you and keep safe. And since Mary has our host, Mary, so let me be the one to move forward with our program since Mary, I think has connected the issues. Oh, Mary's here. Hi, Mary. Okay, Mary, Hello, take everyone. it away. Okay, apologies for the interruption. I, I was having an internet um, connection problem. So let's welcome everyone. We have today um, the newly appointed chairperson of the Legal Education Board to give us uh, her welcoming remarks to all of our participants and guests. Chair Anna Marie Melanie Trinidad. Chair, you're muted, Bo. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Retired Supreme Court Chief Justice Renato Puno, our partners, the Asian Development Bank, the United Nations Environmental Program, and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, Good, our distinguished guests, good morning. I didn't think I would start my message with an apology, but I profusely apologize for being late. It wasn't any connectivity issue. For some reason, all my gadgets weren't working uh, a few moments ago. Um, as you know, I've just been recently appointed to this position in the Legal Education Board. So I am catching the tail end of this very huge endeavor spearheaded by Commissioner Josefa Soradati. Um, just the same, I know that this is the first step in what will be a very successful uh, endeavor, considering that it is being participated in by persons and entities who have a deep-rooted love for the environment. Um, the Philippines is really a fortunate nation because we, are, we have abundant natural resources. We are not lacking in land, sea, mineral, and even human resources. On the other hand, we are a developing nation so that when misfortune visits our natural resources, we don't have enough financial means to recover from the damaging consequences of such visit. But just like many troubles and difficulties, education is a key. And this platform that you have provided us uh, will surely be a first step and a big step in educating the persons who will educate people with respect to dangers that befit or face our environment. Um, we thank our partners for the, this platform wherein luminaries, legal luminaries, both domestically and globally can participate and discuss new issues that face our environment. And of course, provide new teaching methodologies for those who will enlighten, those that need enlightenment in this field. Um, I would like to thank also um, the persons who made this possible, uh, Commissioner Sorerati uh, and the other members of the board. Um, we thank you for, without your daily efforts, this would not have uh, been even begun. Um, I would like to add to the dangers that face our environment, those that were mentioned by our uh, Supreme Court, retired Supreme Court Chief Justice. Um, aside from the deliberate activities of man, we also have innocent activities that without us knowing, damage our environment. We drive our cars, we uh, cool our homes with air conditioners, and in cold climates, uh, countries with cold climates, they have, of course, heaters to heat their surroundings. And of course, we cook food. Uh, these otherwise innocent activities uh, take up oil, uh, coal, and gas, and of course, damage our environment. And so radical changes have to be made if only we can be certain that the environment we live in and man will survive at the same time. So I would not anymore want to uh, take much of your time. Thank you. And uh, we wish everyone luck in the beginning of this uh, endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Melanie. Now a message from one of our partner institutions, the United Nations Environment Program or UNEP, we have with us today Dr. Georgina Loy, UN Environmental Program Regional Coordinator of Environmental Law and Governance Regional Office for Asia and Pacific. Thank you very much, Mary, and, and good morning. I'm delighted to be here today on behalf of UNEP, uh, joining the launch event of the Environmental Law Teachers Online Training Program led by the Legal Education Board of the Philippines. Attorney Anna Marie Melanie Trinidad, Chair of the Legal Education Board, Thomas Clark, ADB General Counsel, Chief Justice Renato Puno, Attorney Rosalisa Ismasorio, 
Professor Galahad Pe Bonito, uh, Jonathan Liliabad, Atani, Anna, oh, sorry, Marina, Romina, Gumal, and Attorney Tony Apolza, friends, fellow lawyers, and educators. Building capacity to strengthen institutions and advance environmental rule of law is at the heart of UNEP's environmental law program. It's also a core pillar of the fifth Montevideo program for the development and periodic review of environmental law, also known as Montevideo 5. UNEP is really delighted to support this TTT program and work closely with academia to inspire and educate a new generation of environmental advocates and lawyers. We know, and it's been said by some of the speakers already, that environmental legal education is fundamental to engaging the environmental consciousness of young, and maybe not so young, lawyers. At the Oceania Environmental Law Conference that was held recently, it was posited by one of the speakers that all lawyers could be environmental lawyers, and I agree. The triple planetary crises that we're facing of pollution, biodiversity loss and climate change will be the greatest threat to both planet and people. Environmental degradation will undermine the rule of law and result in violations of human rights, causing a multitude of environmental injustices. We need lawyers who can advocate for the environment and uphold core principles of environmental law. These are essential for sustainable development and addressing the environmental crises. As Thomas has already mentioned, this program will support the development of environmental law champions. And there is no time that we need environmental law champions more than today. Personally, my training in, in environmental law and the inspiration of the environmental legal academics under whom I studied was pivotal in fueling the passion to pursue a career in environmental law. Equally as important as the lectures were the opportunities for practical application, the field trips, understanding how, for example, a mining proposal is assessed through environmental impact assessment and social impact assessment processes and witnessing this at a potential mine site. Also exploring the governance of solid waste management through an assessment of environmental harms at a municipal dump site. And there are many other examples of these practical applications which can build this passion amongst law students. There have also been the internships. 20 years ago or so, I interned at the Environmental Defenders Office of New South Wales in Australia. And following this, about 17 years ago, I did an internship with the United Nations Environment Program. Indeed, I, I interned with uh, the person who is essentially in the role that I'm in now. And these, again, have been really pivotal in building that passion for environmental law. And I'm sure these are opportunities that will be explored through this program. Later, when I was myself an educator teaching environmental ethics and governance, and attorney Renato Puno has mentioned the key linkages between ethics, law, and environmental protection. I understood the criticality of participatory learning and immersive studies. So through opportunities such as case studies, field trips, clinical legal education, again, students build that passion for environmental law and pursuing good environmental governance and environmental justice. These students will work to uphold rights to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And of course, the rights of nature itself. In order to safeguard the planet for, pres for present and for future generations. So we do need all lawyers to be trained to ensure that environmental laws will be adequately implemented and enforced, and indeed governments will be held accountable for effective and good environmental governance. So thank you so much, all of the educators here, for taking on this task. UNEP is committed to working with academia in the field of environmental law, 
and we sincerely thank the Legal Education Board of the Philippines and our partners, ADB and the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law for collaborating on this very significant and I would say quite frankly, essential component of legal education. So uh, my final note is to wish this training great success. And I look forward to engaging with all of you uh, throughout future sessions of this program. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Georgina Lloyd for your message. Now we also have with us today, one of our partners from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, Academy of Environmental Law. We have with us the, its chair, Attorney Rose Visa Ispa Osorio. Good morning, everyone. To all uh, our, of our esteemed speakers, um, colleagues, and friends, maayang buntag. I'm speaking from Cebu, Philippines. To uh, the Honorable Chair of the Legal Education Board, Anna Marie Melanie Trinidad, um, the General Counsel of the ADB, Thomas Clark, um, the Regional Coordinator of the United Nations Environment Program, Georgina Lloyd Rivera, and the former Chief Justice, Renato Puno. Um, and here with us also is our a good friend and you know one of our inspiring leaders in environmental law, Attorney Tony Oposa. Good morning to everyone. It is an extreme honor to be speaking alongside eminent guests today to celebrate this important milestone in Philippine legal education history. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the Legal Education Board for today's launching of a groundbreaking initiative in collaboration with the Asian Development Bank the United Nations Environment Program, and the Academy of Environmental Law that I am representing. This is indeed um, a trailblazing initiative to conduct a 12-week training of environmental law professors teaching in all 127 law schools in the country. As a current chair of the IUCN Academy of Environmental, Board, uh, environmental Law Governing Board, I, am, I was proud to announce this initiative to our fellow board members and get their full support. The IUCN is actually, um, the Academy of Environmental Law is known as a global community of environmental law scholars all over the world. It is a licensed member of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the world's oldest and largest global environmental network for the conservation of nature. The IUCN brings together governments, international organizations, non-government organizations, local communities, and private enterprises together to engage in research and field projects that will develop solutions to the most pressing environmental challenges that we are facing today. The IUCN clearly understood the role early on that on the role that law needed to play in response to these environmental challenges. So in 2003, the IUCN endorsed the idea of an Academy of Environmental Law at the first colloquium in Shanghai, China. Since then, the Academy has held 18 annual colloquia in different parts of the globe in collaboration with our institutional members. This serves as an opportunity for members to meet annually and share their researchers, teaching methodologies, and meet and network and discuss collaborations with other colleagues in the field. Um, we have had several colloquium and I think colloquia, and one of this is actually was held in Cebu, Philippines, uh, the 17th annual colloquium. Unfortunately, last year we had to postpone our colloquium, and uh, but we held it this year which went entirely virtual. And um, this was hosted by the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And we talked about the future of environmental law, ambition and reality. Next year, the Academy Colloquium will employ a hybrid format with its host at Queensland University of Technology at Brisbane. Um, the host is actually here, uh, Dr. Amanda Vincent. 
uh, for next year's adult colloquium. So you might want to talk to her about this as well. And in 2003, we can hopefully go back to an in-person colloquium at the University of Eastern Finland. The IUCN Academy is now comprised of more than 214 universities from 60 countries with more than 800 environmental law scholars interacting and exchanging knowledge, experiences, and resources. It is governed by board members representing 10 major regions of the world, plus the chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law and executive director of the IUCN Environmental Law Program. I myself represent the Southeast Asia region, and I was fortunate enough to be elected as the chair of the governing board about two years ago. So today is actually a testament and product of the knowledge exchange work of the IUCN Academy together with um, the ADB, which it, start, which it started in 2016. So about six years ago, the Academy together with the ADB this uh, started this uh, train, to train, train the Trainers program that trained and linked environmental law cha champions in Asia and the Pacific. And I was one of those who were lucky to be invited and eventually became a focal person of the Philippines uh, Train the Trainers program. Thereafter, we were able to organize two in-country trainings in the Philippines in various aspects of teaching environmental law with resource persons coming from members of the Academy of Environmental Law. And the support and the commitment of ADP through Christina Pack and her team um, was very valuable because they have continued to support environmental training, law training in the region. And this has been truly remarkable. Hence, we now find ourselves here today. And I hope that this training will inspire you to be better versions of yourselves at, as teachers of environmental law. Environmental law has really been and become an important platform in a number of countries for considerable innovation on in legal teaching methodology. So over the next 12 years, we can learn about the range of teaching methodologies that goes beyond the entrenched Socratic lecture-based paradigm for legal education. We will learn about how to adapt to teaching in a virtual classroom. And all this can hopefully help us think differently about what we do as environmental law teachers and scholars and understand why we do it. So lastly, um, I would like to extend an invitation for you and your institutions to join the Academy of Environmental Law. This is truly something that you could really be um, of use to your advancement as environmental law scholars, not only here in the Philippines, but also globally. So thank you to everyone uh, for, for the initiative that we are in today and those who have been uh, responsible for, um, for this event that we are launching today. So good morning, everyone, and see you in the future sessions of this training program. Thank you, Attorney Lisa. Now to hear from one of our own, a member of the Environmental Law Faculty, he himself is a professor. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today Attorney Galahad E. Benito. To the ADB, LEB, UNEP, and IUCN for sponsoring this event. To former Chief Justice Reynato Puno for giving us a very special procedure. To my distinguished professor, Tony Oposa, and to all of you attending this online event, good morning. The world is a better place because of what we are about to start today. How important are teachers in the lives of their students? Days ago, my environmental law professor in the United States retired. I sent Professor Hauk, Oliver Hauk, an email, thanking him for teaching me environmental law. Professor Hauk emailed me back with the following message. All I did was to teach you a thing or two about environmental law. Look what you've done with it. I am addressing you today because I am who I am because of the great teachers in my life. Before I even became a student of Professor Howe, I was a student first and foremost of Tony Oposa. By the way, they are friends. Having Howe and Oposa as teachers is like having the Delta and Lambda variants of COVID-19. They are very infectious. 
Perhaps it was because of this combination that pushed me to petition the Legal Education Board in May to make environmental law mandatory in law school. Thank God, the lab listened and future generations of law students would now have the opportunity to study environmental law and save a dying planet. Let me thank Commissioner Jose Fati for making this possible. Our gratitude goes to her. Fellow teachers, this is an opportunity for us to change the world. Let us teach our students a thing or two about environmental law and let us see what they will do with it. Let us make them feel the warmth of the trees, the joy of the birds, the hymn of the wind, and the calmness of the sea. There is a higher and hidden law that our students need to explore so that nature may simply survive and coexist with us. Through this training, let us make environmental law an instrument of change in our people's lives. If we have 25 students and we are able to change five of them, and they are able to change another five, who in turn are able to change another five, imagine the multiplier effect this would bring. Translated to details, we have more people who will not litter the streets, who will recycle and segregate their waste, and who will embrace and protect the trees. I am sure you will agree with me that environmental law is the best subject in law school. There's no other course in law school more beautiful than environmental law. Is there any other law that allows an ordinary fisherman or a simple farmer to sue a cabinet secretary, a provincial governor, or the richest tycoon? No other course but environmental law. It is September and Christmas is just around the corner. And yet, we are full of dread and sorrow. Many people are sick, many are dying, and many are hungry. And yet, when we look at our students, there's life and optimism and a chance for change. Through this training, let us force the hopelessness of the present into an enduring hope for the future. Let us be better teachers that our students can emulate. Let, let us teach them a thing or two about environmental law, for I am sure they are going to do something with it. Thank you, and God bless all the environmental law professors this morning. Thank you, Attorney Galahad, for that wonderful message to our participants and to all of our guests. Now, to give an insight and overview of this training program, we have with us today one of our invited resource speakers from Australian National University, Dr. Jonathan David Black. Uh, thank you, and good morning. Um, I want to extend my thanks uh, for the invitation uh, that came from the ADB, the Legal Education Board, uh, UNEP, and the IUCN, IUCN Academy of Environmental Law. I extend greetings um, to Anna Marie Trinidad, uh, Thomas Clark, uh, Chief Justice uh, Renato Puno, uh, Dr. Georgina Lloyd, as well as to my fellow academics, uh, Rosaliza Esma Osorio, uh, Galahad Benito, uh, Maria Romina Gumal, and Antonio Oposa. Some of you have met me before, uh, and it's very good to see you again. Uh, many of you, uh, this is the first time that we've met and I hope this is the start of a very long-term and rewarding uh, friendship uh, for all of us. Um, my comments at this time are going to be brief. Uh, the bulk of my time today is actually during part two, uh, where I'll be spending more time uh, uh, discussing um, the starting point, I think, for our discussion about updating the, the, the environmental law curriculum. At, for the present time, I'll just make note of several things. To begin, uh, we live in a time of global change. I think all of us are aware that there are events that are overtaking us in, with respect to things like climate, biodiversity, energy, uh, waste. All of these things are reflecting the nature of environmental problems as becoming transnational. They affect uh, more than one society, 
they cross political borders, and the causes, the dynamics, and impacts affects us as a species. The implication of this is that the world is coming to the Philippines in terms of environmental problems coming to the shores of the archipelago. It also means that the problems in the Philippines are affecting the world, that many of the environmental problems that are occurring in the lands and waters of the Philippine islands are extending and connecting to environmental problems in the region as a whole. As a result of the scale of the environmental problems that we face, that there is a growing awareness and a growing movement within the environmental law uh, faculty around the world to address the need to change the way we teach environmental law and indeed the way we teach uh, law as a whole. So we mentioned earlier that there was the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law. I also want to point out that this is parallel to movements that are happening in other uh, law societies. So um, I would mention the Law and Society Association, the American Society of International Law, the International Law Association. Um, I became aware of these parallel movements at the IUCN World Conservation Congress that occurred two weeks ago. So I can assure you that the efforts that you are undertaking today are not, and in the future are not isolated. You are not working alone, that you are part of a much larger global movement among environmental law faculty and indeed among law faculty as a whole. All of this, all of these efforts are being directed to deal with the totality of the realities that we face in terms of our environmental problems. They are becoming an existential threat to peoples, to societies, to states, to civilizations, uh, to species, not just human species, but all species which is why I think that this upcoming effort to update the environmental law curriculum in the Philippines is supremely timely in the sense that it represents an opportunity uh, for the environmental law curriculum within the Philippines and all the law schools in the Philippines to address the growing environmental problems that are occurring within your country, but also the region and then the world as a whole and to connect your efforts to the larger efforts that are happening with environmental law faculty uh, in other countries. So I welcome you to that. I look forward to working with all of you. This, uh, in during part two, um, I will be presenting a framework that I think uh, helps all of us to organize our thoughts and provides a way of starting on this journey together in updating the environmental law curriculum. Uh, thank you. And I look forward to working with all of you soon. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan. We hope to see you in the upcoming sessions of the training program. So for the training objectives and the schedule of our training program, let me discuss to you um, our training objectives. So first, for the, training, for the training program, we hope to elevate the discussion on the current state of environmental law in the Philippines. We also hope to identify key issues, challenges, and innovations in the said field. And lastly, we hope to enhance the methods and pedagogy in teaching environmental law. For the schedule of our training programs, it will be a 12-week course beginning September 22 today until December, December 8, 2021. So for the first session, we will have it on this coming Wednesday, September 29, 2021. And the topic is State of Environmental Law in the Philippines, Evolution, Challenges, Prospects, and Opportunities. For the second session, we will conduct it on October 6, 2021. And the topic is Teaching Environmental Law Online, Benefits and Challenges of Online Teaching. The third session will be on October 13, 2021. And the topic is Methodology in the Teaching Environmental Law. The fourth session on October 2021, We'll discuss about the key environmental issues in rec and recent developments in environmental law. For the fifth session, where our resource speaker for today, Dr. Jonathan discussed earlier, will be our um, resource speaker. Um, on October 20 27, 2021, he will discuss the syllabus review workshop together with our other invited resource speakers. For the, sec for the sixth session, on November 3, 2021, on Pedagogical Engagement on Environmental Law. 
and the seventh session will be on November 10, 2021. For the role of courts in addressing environmental protection in the Philippines. The eighth session will be on November 17, 2021, for the panel discussion on climate change law. And the ninth session will be on November 24, 2021, which, will, we, which we will discuss how to design an environmental law clinic, its experiences and challenges of those who have established environmental law clinic in the Philippines. The 10th session, which will be on December 1, 2021, will discuss about the Environmental Law in Asia, Environmental Law Academics Panel from Southeast Asia and Opportunities, opportunities for Comparative Law. The 11th session and our last session, which, was, which will also be our closing session, will be on December 8, 2021, and we will discuss Environmental Law in, an, in the Anthropocene. So everyone, before we proceed to our break, um, we would like to um, introduce to you to our um, last speaker for today. We have with us today our, a very special guest, an environmental advocate himself. We have Attorney Antonio Oposa Jr. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Attorney. And, uh, is it okay? Uh, good morning, everyone. Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat at sa mga bisaya, mayong buntag ninyo. Uh, thank you, especially to the Legal Education Board and especially to Jojo Sorerati, to Ma'am Zeni Elipano, to Mary Gumal, and now to Anne-Marie Melanie Trinidad for putting environment law in the law school curriculum. Alam nyo ba ho, na ayon po sa United Nations Environment Program, that the Philippines, and we can say this with pride, that the Philippines is the first and only country in the world that has put environment law as a required subject in the law school curriculum. Uh, greetings, special greetings to my idol, uh, CJ Renato Puno, the architect of the environmental rules of court during his term as, a, as chief justice and the author of the writ of Kalikasan. Special greetings. I saw his face there somewhere. Special greetings to the father of environmental law in the Philippines, Ambassador Amado Ding Tolentino. Siya po ang ama ng environmental law sa Pilipinas. Uh, Hello also to my former star student, now my former, now my star colleague, Galahad Pebinito, who put together the petition to make environmental law, to not to remove environmental law uh, instead, and to the Legal Education Board, kudos, instead of removing environmental law from the school curriculum, you know, one required subject. Congratulations. And also to the rock star, Pauline, Dean Pauline Alfuente, um, and to all of you professors who are and who will be teaching environmental law. Kaya ang mga kasama namin, si Wilmon Pinalosa, I also see Vicky Luanson, my former partner, Vicky Luanson. And um, mga kaibigan, when travel restrictions ease and health uh, conditions are better, I hope to meet everyone in person because together with some friends, we would like to go on a, not a lecture tour, but a storytelling tour all over to meet your students. Thank you to Lisa Osorio, my longtime friend. By the way, she is the first Asian to be chair of the International Academy of Environmental Law. Thank you, Lisa, for helping organize this. And to our friends in the ADP, Christina Pak, Irum Hassan, Thomas Clark, I just uh, met you now, and uh, Brioni, I would like to invite, I extended to you an invitation. There is a new beach house only two hours away from here, and we can discuss, the group. We can discuss uh, many things there. My friends, we are here because we are friends. The author C.S. Lewis defines friendship as people who shared passion. And we are here because we share a passion 
for the environment. But let us pause to think for a while. Ano ba yung environment? Manakakain ba yan? Is it, the bird, is it about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees and the monkeys and the donkeys? Or is it about life and the sources of life of land, air, and water? Mary, please show the film. The Law of Life. What is the environment? Is it about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees? Or is it about life and the sources of life, of land, air, and water? The trees and the forests are the heart and the lungs that give us air to breathe. The land and the soil are the skin and the flesh that give us food to eat. The sea and the rivers are the blood and bloodstreams of life that give us water to drink. They are the vital organs of life on earth. Land, air, and water. The law of life. The law. My friends, that is all my message. Once we understand that the environment is not about the monkeys and the donkeys, but it is about life and the sources of life of land, air, and water. We will do everything in our power to help care for it. Again, congratulations to the Legal Education Board and congratulations in advance to those who will be teaching, as Galahad said, the multiplier effect is so powerful. Good luck sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Attorney Oposa, for your wonderful message and very lovely video presentation. It is true that life will not prosper without land, air, and water, or the law of life. Now, to give you, our dear participants, a glimpse of our partner's institution, advocacies, and programs, we prepared a short video presentation of the Asian Development Bank Train the Trainers Program. Angelo. When I first heard about the TOT program, I was a bit uh, skeptical because I thought that I'm teaching for uh, nearly two decades. What else they are going to teach me? But after coming here, I'm really, really surprised that there's so many things to know and to learn and to adopt for myself. I'm happy to report that, you know, ever since I came back from the uh, TTT in Manila, the number of students has increased. The first set of students which I taught in 2015 after I came back was four students. And the next semester, the registration went up to 30 students. That was the maximum limit. And ever since then, it was holding steady between 25 to 30. And the students themselves came back to me and said that this is the first elective subject that they have enjoyed. I mean, the great value that I've seen of this TTT program is really the networking. They've now developed networks which have been fantastic and they've you know, been exposed to other environmental law professors within their region and they're doing amazing things. What is surprising to me, it is that after the TTT, several of our professors um, started another group. That is not for the environmental teachers alone, but also for the environmental protection agency, the local people who really go to the polluters to find. I never realized there were so many practical questions that has to be answered. And what chemicals is toxic? Why it is toxic? What's the legal basis? How much I should find? That's also uh, not only benefit those officials, 
but also benefits the teachers because that's the real things, the real world. Yeah. It's amazing. And uh, I think the group, uh, group is growing, growing, growing. By focusing on training the trainers, we create the infrastructure to ensure that this growing demand for environmental law knowledge is going to be satisfied. I think this has been probably the biggest success that the Academy has had to date because they've succeeded in mobilizing professors from all over Asia at a time when there is such a huge demand for improving environmental law and yet nearly all these universities lack the capacity to be able to teach environmental law because they didn't have people who had the specialized knowledge that the environmental law field requires. After uh, this ADBTTT program, I told my students, go to an affected area, meet the stakeholders, we want to find out why exactly is this problem. For example, there was a lake nearby which was being encroached by a lot of uh, illegal occupants. So two guys went there and uh, met the residents. They went to the, uh, the elected representatives of the municipal bodies. They went to the government officials who are responsible for protecting the natural resources. So the, the moment when they reached the uh, uh, government officials, uh, they got a point that these students are really going to make it a big issue. And therefore, uh, the government immediately acted upon uh, this issue and they cleared all the encroachments and they built a wall around the lake to protect it permanently. I think this is a small victory. As a teacher that I could inspire my students to do such a thing, the change should start from each and every one of us. Look, it's been inspirational, frankly. I've, I've found myself totally inspired by the commitment, the enthusiasm and the capacity of the people that we've been very fortunate to locate. So we're actually building a bottom-up resource now uh, of environmental law teachers and to, to which we're adding all the new people that are coming in through the training, mixing with the more older experienced teachers in their own country and building a, a whole base there uh, to carry this work on uh, well into the future, and which I think is one of the most exciting things of all, to see that this project has a, a lifetime of longevity and a sustainability beyond the actual training. All right, I hope our dear participants are inspired to share and join the TTT program of ADB. We will now have our, real, our wellness break. We advise our participants to be back after five minutes. Please, um, you may turn off your camera and we will just um, advise you as we proceed to the part two of our program. Welcome back, everyone. I hope everyone is in already. And I hope you enjoy your five minute wellness break. Now let's proceed to the part two of our program today. I am pleased to announce also that we are now one hundred. We are now one hundred fifteen participants in our today's event. Also, we have today Lab Commissioner Commissioner Abelardo Dubundon to join us in our activity. Let's now proceed to part two of our program. I give the floor to my co-host, ADB's Environmental Council, Mr. Matthew Bard. Matthew, take the floor. Thank you very much indeed, Mary. And may I congratulate the Philippine Legal Education Board um, for a great launch and all our speakers. I certainly hope uh, you are feeling um, inspired. Um, so we are running a little bit over time, um, but I hope the inspiration carries through for our next uh, 10 weeks on this amazing journey. Um, so my name is Matthew Baird. I'm an Australian environmental lawyer. Um, I've been based in Southeast Asia for the past 12 years. And as Prof Galahad talked about teachers, it reminded me of my environmental law lecturer, Nicola Franklin in 1988, which was a, a few years ago when I studied environmental law at Sydney University. Um, and certainly that was the inspiration moment for me. Um, I was involved in local community politics to try and protect um, cultural issues and heritage issues um, in the Australian um, uh, colonial heritage um, sort of fights uh, and natural heritage. And so I've been an environmental lawyer since that time. Um, so I'm very, very excited to be here as a, as a consultant for the Asian Development Bank um, and the team led by Christina Pack 
uh, to look at the development of the train the teachers work and working with um, Philippine Legal Education Board. So the next part of our program is really um, talking about the importance of curriculum development. And so for that, we have a uh, very special guest of Josh Dr. Jonathan Liliabad, uh, whom I've worked with uh, extensively in Myanmar, as well as at some other countries. Um, and while it, before I turn the floor over to Dr. Jonathan, I would like to just uh, give a short introduction. Um, so Jonathan uh, has many years experience as a university instructor in law and social sciences, and he's had at, over the last six years, significant experience in delivering training programs for government ministries in Myanmar, uh, and the Philippines, including the Philippines Judicial Academy. Um, he has served as a consultant with NGOs such as the International Commission of Jurists, the Danish Institute of Human Rights and the Conrad Adendauer Stiftung. Um, he's designed and taught courses aimed at maturing working professionals using both offline and online teaching technologies, enabling synchronous, synch synchronous and asynchronous learning, engagement and assessment in both individual and team settings. He has taught courses in Myanmar, the Philippines, Japan, Singapore, United States, and Australia. He is currently a senior lecturer at the Australian National University College of Law. He holds a PhD and JD, both from the University of Southern California and a Bachelor of uh, BS from the California Institute of Technology, with extensive field research on international environmental law, environmental conservation, and development aid in Southeast Asia. He was born in Myanmar, but has lived in Sweden, the United States, and currently resides in uh, Canberra, Australia. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome him here today. Um, Jonathan has been engaged by the ADB as part of the development of environmental law curriculum, um, both in, um, uh, in Southeast Asia and with a project that we're also launching a regional task force on environmental law curriculum uh, for the Greater Mekong region. So it's with great pleasure that I invite Jonathan to give his presentation today. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, thanks, Matthew, for the kind words. And, um, and I, that was a very good job of giving a summary of my life uh, for everyone. Um, I know that everyone um, has reminded me extensively that uh, they think I'm Filipino and then I have to break the news to them that I was born in Myanmar. But, um, uh, you know, given enough time, I, I will make every effort uh, to learn Filipino culture and to learn the language. Um, and so one day uh, I hope to join you in spirit. And once the COVID restrictions uh, lift, um, I do hope that we can all meet, meet in person um, and get to know each other uh, better. So I'm going to share my screen. And, okay. Um, one second. This is, here we go. Okay. So, all of you, uh, I hope, uh, can see my PowerPoint, and then I'll. Um, so I, I don't uh, hope to provide any direct answers uh, for today uh, for this um, discussion. This is really more a starting point uh, for the upcoming weeks. I, I really just want to help uh, 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 provide a framework to help uh, organize our thoughts about the kinds of changes that uh, we want to discuss. Um, and the kinds of directions that we wish to go when we say that we are going to do an update of the environmental law curriculum. So there are a number of factors uh, that I am aiming at and um, specifically, uh, you know, what is it that we mean when we say uh, environmental law? What does it mean when we say that we are teaching environmental law? Uh, from my perspective, uh, this concern was about ontology and epistemology. Um, uh, ontology is, you know, what is it that we mean when we say the words environmental law curriculum? And then epistemology is uh, how do we go about carrying that out? How do we do it? And um, I refer to the work that I've done previously. There's a publication that will be appearing uh, next year with the Asian Journal of Law and Society regarding the integration of the Anthropocene into legal education. And so a lot of the questions that I think uh, need to be addressed uh, involve not just the Anthropocene, but environmental law as a whole. 
And so I'm drawing a, upon a lot of that. Um, I hope to have the PDF of that article uh, within the next couple of months, and I'd be more than happy to share that PDF uh, once it's uh, released by the publisher. But um, uh, generally speaking, the framework involves three components, uh, which is uh, the, the question of curriculum placement. How do we want environmental law to appear within a larger uh, legal education curriculum? Uh, what is the content or the substance of environmental law when we teach it? And then what is the pedagogy? What are the teaching methods um, that we want to employ uh, to carry out uh, the content? I'll begin with the question of curriculum placement. Um, and again, uh, I'm not providing any specifics at this time. Uh, what I've done here is that I've uh, given a lot of question marks. And the reason I put those question marks in there is to just simply indicate that these are discussion points, things to sort of reflect on. Um, on the left-hand side are the, I think are the issues that, have, that are posed by the question of curriculum placement. And then the right-hand side, I think are the uh, contextual specifics of your individual law schools. So I don't mean Philippines as, uh, as a, as a whole, I'm talking about your individual law schools and what you understand is happening uh, or are the requirements for your individual universities. But on the left-hand side, um, the, the kinds of issues that have cropped up uh, with teaching environmental law uh, and other scenarios that I've come across, um, I'll, I, I want to note here is that there's this question about, do we want environmental law to be treated as a discrete subject? So it's an individual dedicated subject that's given um, an allocated number of course credits over, the, over a space of a semester, or do we want it to be pervasive? So in other words, that there are certain concepts, ideas, and content that are not encompassed within a single subject, a single course, but instead is distributed across different uh, courses as a whole. So an example of this is, um, you know, do we want um, um, the trail smelter case to be treated as an environmental law uh, case, or do we want trail smelter to be taught as part of an international arbitration course? The other question here is doctrinal versus interdisciplinary. Uh, historically in the past, uh, I know that when I was in law school, um, I was the beneficiary of a course uh, taught uh, by uh, Christopher Stone. But uh, environmental law uh, in that era was, was treated as a doctrinal issue. It was purely in terms of law. However, in recent years, there's been a, a push for inter interdisciplinary approaches that uh, there's a recognition that a lot of environmental law problems are, are holistic and we need to uh, help our law students uh, gain an awareness and an understanding of these other uh, perspectives that are, that are relevant to dealing with environmental issues. Another question is about clinical versus holistic approaches. Are, you know, are we purely uh, interested in getting uh, students prepared for practice as lawyers, or are we trying to prepare them for alternative careers outside of legal practice? Um, in the Philippines, it's made compulsory. Um, and so I, I don't think that's an issue. An issue that I do think is uh, going to be of increasing relevance is that um, uh, for LLB programs, we have environmental law taught at undergraduate level. Um, but I know that there's a number of law schools that involve JDs, LLMs, and in some cases, PhDs. And so the question there is, how is, what, is it, what are the implications in terms of how environmental law is uh, delivered to those particular audiences? And then the last, I think, that I've listed here, at least the, one of the questions I've come across is, do we treat environmental law as a domestic issue? So it's purely taught with an environmental, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, purely taught within a domestic law framework? Or uh, do we want to make references to international law and developments in international law that are occurring at this time? The second uh, uh, component of the framework is content. Now, I'm not going to read out all of this. Um, we don't have the time for that uh, today. And I'd rather devote uh, more of my time for question and answers uh, to try and help everyone set the stage for the next uh, next few weeks. But I will say here that um, when we talk about the, the substance of environmental law, what it is that we're teaching, um, it's, you know, there's a question of topics. And I, you know, I think that's a very uh, important conversation that we all would want to engage in. I've listed uh, sample topics here, but this is by no means comprehensive. I know that this is something that many people uh, uh, think are 
wants to, or want to address that at, at, a, at a school level. Um, but I think at, as a part of a, a national movement, I, I think it does uh, uh, call for time uh, for everyone to reflect about well, what is it that we want uh, to promote on a, on a national scale and how does that extend to um, uh, an international scale. The other component of this are the knowledge systems. Um, so what I want to point out here is that um, this movement towards interdisciplinary approaches is partially in response to a growing recognition of different uh, different understandings of the environment. So there's a scientific understanding that I think most people are familiar with and most of you have, have uh, gained through your education. Uh, but there's a lot of other work that's been done in other fields, uh, areas like economics, statistics, for example. Uh, within my research, it's the question of indigenous knowledge systems and how they're uh, relevant to studying environmental issues, particularly with indigenous knowledge systems uh, that um, connect to um, the way we should treat and interact with the environment because that constitutes or implies uh, a rules-based system, so a form of indigenous law. And uh, at the international level, at least, there's a growing awareness and a growing sensitivity for indigenous law um, and indigenous uh, knowledge systems. So the question, in my mind at least, is how do we integrate those uh, within our teaching? The other uh, aspects that I think are relevant um, and to sort of help organize our thinking is what are the institutions that we want to include? You know, in terms of what are, we want our students to learn, do we want them to learn institutions like the United Nations, the IUCN, um, uh, related institutions within the World Heritage System like ECOMOS? Um, or are we, do we want them to focus more on aspects such as the Supreme Court? Uh, do we want them to focus on other in institutions like the World Bank? Uh, what is it that we think is relevant for them to understand? The same questions uh, sort of apply, I mean, similarly apply with questions about the nature of law that we want them to learn. Um, um, it's what I've encountered in other scenarios is a question of, do we want environmental law to be purely in terms of domestic law, or do we want it to have some connection to the ongoing movements and changes in international environmental law? On a deeper level, is it going beyond simple uh, learning of the law in terms of text, uh, instruments, and extending to actual principles uh, that we want them to pick up so that they're capable of engaging uh, in critical and formative discussions about what we want the law to become going into the future? Another area that I think is deserving um, of, of discussion about the nature of cases, um, I know that uh, I've spoken to, to a number of you I know that there is a slate of uh, Philippines environmental law cases. Um, in other uh, scenarios that I've taught, um, the domestic law cases uh, have been also uh, placed alongside international law cases uh, to help facilitate uh, comparison, uh, not just between domestic and international levels, but across different countries. And one of the motivations for this is to address the transnational nature of environmental problems and to sort of become more aware and sensitive to um, different uh, approaches with shared environmental issues. The last I think is um, going beyond the clinical aspect and dealing more with the academic component uh, because of the growing uh, research literature that's being done by uh, academic uh, scholars. Uh, many of you are engaged in research on environmental law issues. You're connecting and collaborating with uh, scholars outside of environmental law. Uh, not just within the legal discipline as a whole, but also within um, the academic community um, more broadly. And so the question mark then becomes, uh, do we want to enrich the understanding uh, that our students have uh, of environmental issues and environmental law based on the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary experiences that we have as scholars in other areas? The last uh, component of the framework um, here, and then I think I'll open things up for Q&A, this is a question of pedagogy. Um, so uh, Lisa had alluded to this earlier. Um, what I'm presenting here is again, just a way of thinking through uh, the different aspects of pedagogy. So pedagogy means more than just the teaching method. Um, it also involves uh, the kinds of things that we want to carry forward in what we're teaching. In, it's, um, it's tied to the evolution of technology. So yes, in class and online, but one of the things that I've witnessed, uh, particularly among my own students, is this increasing uh, deployment of mobile technologies. So this is going beyond uh, internet in terms of landlines, 
but actual uh, uh, social media applications, communications applications, uh, data applications that are downloadable onto mobile phones. The other uh, thing that's uh, come up, at least uh, with the students that I've had, is this increasing interest in field work, uh, particularly with students who want to gain a greater understanding of uh, what actually happens outside the classroom that I've encountered a growing demand among students to actually go into the field, to actually, uh, when, when I say go into the field, I mean that literally. Like, you know, they're getting rid of the dress shoes, they're putting on boots, they're getting rid of the, uh, the blazers and the slacks, and they're actually putting on uh, much more rugged uh, materials. They want to deal with animals, they want to touch the, the trees. Um, you know, as, as Tony Oposa had alluded to earlier, um, they actually want to get out and see the birds, the trees, um, everything else. They want to experience what it is that they're dealing with. So how do we bridge to that? How do we address that? Um, I've also included categories for knowledge, skills, and values. So this is something that I know that has been, um, it's a methodology that's been deployed by the United Nations, the World Bank. Um, but I think it's relevant here in terms of helping organize what it is that we want the pedagogy to be doing. Um, when, we, when we engage in these different teaching methods, you know, whether, whether it be case method, Socratic method, um, games, um, uh, classroom activities, what is it that we want the students to, to acquire? Um, is it that we want them to learn all of the content that we give to them in terms of the knowledge? Um, but are we want, do we want deeper development of our students in terms of actual skills? such as um, critical analysis skills, creativity skills, the levels of resourcefulness, their ability to work together as part of a larger group um, on an individual level. Are we asking them to change their character? Do we want them to develop some level of values with respect to the kinds of duties that they understand that they owe not just to the profession, but as to um, the society as a whole, to the environment? Um, are we asking them to acquire uh, public service values? Um, in which case, uh, what is the scope of activism um, that we want them to undertake? So it's these deeper underlying components that I think are connected to the pedagogy. I'm going to finish uh, my comments here uh, today um, just by noting that um, as, as Lisa had uh, indicated, there is a lot of work being done with the Academy of Environmental Law. Um, there is in addition, a lot of work that's being done by the World Commission on Environmental Law, which is a related institution. And the reason I mentioned both of these is that I don't, I want to uh, go beyond treating each of them in isolation. Um, there's a connection. I think there's value in, in, a, in a connection between academics versus practitioners. So the Academy of Environmental Law is predominantly the academics. The World Commission is predominantly practitioners in terms of lawyers and judges. Um, government officials, so anyone working in policy, um, uh, executives working within NGOs and corporations. And I think that there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of value in both of those uh, connecting to each other. So I'm going to stop my presentation there today. Um, I asked, um, I asked the, the, the organizers today to share this, these PowerPoint slides with all of you. So all of you should have access to these. As I mentioned at the very beginning, um, this is just simply meant to be a starting point to help uh, everyone organize their thoughts. Um, my intention is that you can use this framework uh, for your own personal reflections. And then beyond today, as we go forward over the next few, uh, number of weeks, um, you can use this framework uh, and, and think through um, your ideas um, and place them. And then hopefully uh, then, um, have a means to engage in a conversation with each other and, uh, and, and, and create a coherent outcome of the conversations that we're having about updating the environmental law curriculum. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop sharing um, and then devote the rest of the time uh, to Q&A. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And um, thanks uh, in particular also to, to the, uh, the ideas, and I guess that's also one of those things. You know, you you, you mentioned, you know, uh, um, how we teach as well as what we teach. Um, and as Tony, as Tony has pointed out, you know, the the experiential, the art um, is certainly one thing. But as George Georgina Lloyd also mentioned, you know, the 
that are experiential learning, the idea of, and we'll look at this later, um, environmental law clinics, so clinical legal education, um, but also getting out in, into the field. That's not something that I did when I was studying environmental law um, 35 years ago. Now, I have to apologize in that um, we are meant to have finished now, but um, with the permission of the meeting, if, if you need to go, um, the, the timetable did say 11.30. I'm not a harsh lecturer, I, um, uh, I, but I would like just to say that we, we will open up for questions. Um, and if you do have a question, um, please just raise your hand in the reaction box um, and this is the technique we will use um, throughout the course. Um, if you have a, a, a question, you can, you can raise your hand um, and we'll, we'll ask you to unmute yourself and, and give a, a comment or observation. Um, but given the time, I may also ask um, Gladys if we can do, we could start the poll. We have a quick Zoom poll um, that it is important for us to get your initial feedback. Um, on the environmental law um, curriculum considerations. And this is also about um, your expectations. Um, I, this is all anonymous and it's not, it's not going to be marked, um, but we would uh, appreciate if um, during this question and answer, while we're, we're going through the Q&A, that you can answer the questions. And we have three questions. Um, one is about your current expectations of your primary expectation um, from teaching the program. Um, and then uh, teaching methodology, your greatest challenges during online learning. And we understand that there may be a number of lecturers here who are not uh, environmental or natural resources lecturers, but there's a lot of uh, topics that we have over the course of this learning uh, program for pedagogy, for interaction, for understanding how best to both teach, but also how best to engage students. Um, and then the third question is for subject matter expertise, um, are there particular topics that you would like to learn about? Um, and although today has been a little bit more of, of a launch and, and, a, and a talk, um, future sessions are very much designed to be as interactive as possible and to get and to respond to your feedback. Um, but we do have uh, at least another 10 minutes um, before we, can, we should bring it to a close. So are there any questions? I should also point out that um, we hope Jonathan will be able to, to come back. And if that's something that we might want to talk about later in the course when we're talking about revisions to the curriculum. We might we will have another opportunity to to go more in depth with with Jonathan and other other academics from around the region. So if if there is any questions, um, I do see Commissioner Avalado has made a, a comment um, both on the. Uh, the issue of um, uh, the adoption of an academic uh, track um, and how environmental law is, is taught. And I think that's also one of those interesting ideas about both student opportunities to practice environmental law, but also academics opportunities to uh, advance their careers through the teaching of environmental and natural resources law. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like or comments? Um, that they would like. Um, and there is a question um, about, is there a prerequisite subject or knowledge before environmental law? Um, I think, Jonathan, in your experience, did you want to just answer that from your, uh, your academic experience in Australia and America? Yeah, it's, thanks for that question. Um, it's, so in my mind, that's context specific. Um, and it depends on the, the nature of the urgency um, that you perceive and, you know, the level of expertise that you want um, the students to have. Um, you know, so when I went, took environmental law in the United States, it was an elective, uh, but it was considered you know, a, a third year law school subject. Um, it was understood that there needed to be a foundation of concepts, particularly with uh, civil procedure, criminal procedure, um, and then torts. Um, simply because a lot of the case law that was dealing with environmental law was coming through those avenues. And, the, um, and Christopher Stone in particular didn't want to take the time to review those issues. <laughs> uh, whereas uh, within Australia, I'm seeing something different. Uh, you know, it's a situation that uh, even though it's an elective, um, at the undergraduate level, there's no prerequisites being prescribed, um, which I've, I think is quite interesting. 
And um, there's also a separation between um, domestic uh, environmental law versus international environmental law. So international environmental law, there is a prerequisite of international law, uh, but domestic environmental law, there's no prerequisites at all. Um, so I think, you know, so I think it's, um, it depends on what you want, but it, when I say what, what you want, I, what I mean is what I think uh, all of us collectively here have to decide what's most relevant uh, for the Philippines. Thank you. And I've been asked to remind everyone uh, that Angelo has has put a link. Um, we have a Google Doc form um, and we're going to ask um, all the lecturers to, to register. We will be doing a certificate because it's an extensive course. They, we will be issuing a, a certificate of completion. Um, and we also have a uh, we're negotiating for a, a particular um, uh, um, prize, I guess, for, for completing um, the, the curriculum development course. So um, is there any other questions that people not want to ask Jonathan um, or, or any of us? Um, please feel free. Yes. Um, so Ari is Matabag. Did you want to? Can you unmute? Thank you. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Okay. So, so I've been teaching the course for the last two semesters in one of the uh, university here in Manila. And one of the challenges I, I encountered is that some of the environmental issues involved has the science dimension or the technical aspect. So how, how uh, as a lawyer, I, my background would only focus on the, the legal dimension. So how would we address the challenge? Yeah, thanks for that. That's, that's a really important question and something that's become chronic uh, for environmental law wow. teachers. Yeah. <laughs> So that's become a chronic problem for environmental law teachers that I've seen um, across multiple countries. Um, and everyone's asking the same question that um, a lot of the environmental issues have a complexity uh, with science um, that is incredibly difficult, not only to explain to non-scientist uh, students, but also to even understand uh, for those of us who are non-scientist teachers. Um, I'm lucky enough in the sense that my undergraduate degree was in uh, science, um, you know, and coming from uh, Caltech, um, I had access uh, to uh, very high quality science teachers. Um, however, I do sympathize and I do understand uh, with a lot of environmental law teachers in other countries, particularly uh, whose undergraduate backgrounds were predominantly in humanities uh, or social sciences or anything outside of uh, science. Um, the things that have been done is that um, historically, um, again, in multiple countries that I've encountered, historically, environmental law teachers just tried to avoid the science. They didn't wanna get into trouble, so to speak. Um, but the issue there is that um, you're essentially missing out on a lot of the debates, the discussions, the issues uh, about environmental problems. And as a result, there's a danger that whatever laws you prescribe uh, miss out on the fundamental uh, uh, complexities that are at play. Um, there are ways to mitigate that by interdisciplinary work. So this is where I've seen um, in some countries, um, they actually had uh, teachers in science uh, co-teaching uh, some subjects with the law teachers. Um, however, that's incredibly difficult if you had a university that operates on a silo model where different disciplines are operating in isolation. Um, me personally, um, I've actually made it a point within the first week or two weeks of whatever I'm teaching to address the question of science and knowledge systems. Um, and if whatever expertise I don't have, I, I usually try to bring in guest speakers or guest lecturers to at least address, uh, you know, how to teach science to non-scientists. Um, but yeah, exactly. I, I think this is something that I think all of us uh, over the next uh, weeks uh, that we want to give a little bit of time to, to think through. And uh, you know, what are the ways to sort of mitigate this issue? Because it is a problem, and it is a problem that's recognized by environmental law faculty around the world about you know, how do we address this issue? 
Thanks, Jonathan. Um, and there is another question um, about um, the um, uh, from Ishmael Sagaya about best approach to teaching environmental law, theoretical, cl clinical, or both. And perhaps you could mention that in terms of your experience in um, perhaps in, in Myanmar, in terms of the development uh, of environmental and human rights law there. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, it, get, it gets even more complex than just simply saying theory versus clinical. Um, and, you know, in the case of Myanmar, um, it was that you, we had to tie that in with a pro-democracy transition uh, that was happening before uh, 2021. And uh, what I mean by this is that um, when we teach uh, of things, uh, particularly ways of thinking, critical analysis, the acceptance of diverse viewpoints, um, in engagement with pluralist perspectives. So in other words, that engagement with people you disagree with, engagement with perspectives of things you don't understand. Um, and as a result of that, it was tied very much to the reform movements that were happening in the country. Um, and so it wasn't just about theoretical versus clinical, but it was actually, who, what do we mean by clinical? Who do we engage to help uh, teach students beyond the classroom? And it wasn't just theoretical, but it was whose theories Right, you know, what theories are we prescribing? Is it you know Marxist perspectives? Is it fascist perspectives that are that would appease the military? Or are we talking about pro-democracy perspectives that you know that invite debate and discussion? These kinds of issues. Um, but absolutely, um, I don't think that purely theoretical conversations are no longer sufficient. Um, I I do agree with Tony Oposa um, that you know we have to get students out of the classroom. We have to get them out into the air. Uh, we have to get them to see what, what, the, what the consequences are of our activities. Um, my, my teacher, Christopher Stone, you know, I, I, he was a great teacher, um, but he was very much confined to the classroom. Um, and there was a, an entire reality that I, an entire education that I had to experience um, going out into the field. And it was only by seeing what was actually happening in Myanmar, out in the villages, out in the jungle, out in the mountains, uh, with the peasants, with the hunters, um, that I really started to appreciate the magnitude of what it was that we were doing when we were trying to create and formulate and understand environmental law. Um, and it wasn't just about what was important to me as a teacher, but it was important about what was happening out um, in, the, in the field. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. And look, thank you very much for the questions. Um, and we will capture the chat um, because we want to um, uh, share um, these um, some of the comments as we go through, but I do notice the time, so I'm I'm going to say, look, thank you also for the poll results. Um, can I also thank Dr. Jonathan for his presentation today? I know he's part of this uh, the program that we're we're launching uh, with the regional task force um, on the model environmental law curriculum, with with a focus on the Mekong, but that will integrate with the work being done. Um, by the Philippine Legal Education Board and, and all of the wonderful academics who have joined us today. Um, with that, um, I will, uh, I have closed the poll and we'll share the results for next week. Um, but can I pass now over back to, to Mary? Um, and thank you very much indeed, Salamat Paul. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you to you, Matthew also. So now let's go to the end of our program. We will have one of LED's Commissioner, Commissioner Josefe Sorarity, to give the closing remarks for today's event. Dagang salamat, Mary, and dag sa dagang salamat, Jonathan and Matthew. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for, the, for sharing to us what should be considered when we design our own curriculum or syllabus for environmental law. And Matthew, thank you also for taking care of us during the question and answer. In addition to that, I would also like to thank these two gentlemen because Jonathan and Matthew are helping us in the development of our 12 uh, sessions in this training program. So salama. They say that grace is transformative. And indeed, we had an abundance of grace today. And I thank everyone for being with us today. I thank our resource persons, our guest speaker, uh, Chief Justice Puno, the General Counsel of ADB, Thomas Clark, Dr. Georgina Lloyd of IUC, 
of the UN Environmental Program, Attorney Rose Lisa, who's also helping us design this uh, activity. Then, of course, Professor Galahad is also one of the persons who have helped us design this activity. And, of course, uh, Sir Tony Oposa, who planted the seed. That's why we're all here today, because of Sir Tony. He really was the one who wrote us in the Legal Education Board suggesting this training program for all of you environmental law faculty. I would also want to say my thank you to the chair of the Curriculum Review Committee, our commissioner, Abelardo Domondon, who's with us today. He headed that curriculum review that ensured that environmental law will become a mandatory subject in all the law schools in the country. So Kom Abi, thank you so much for leading us in the curriculum review committee. Without your leadership, we wouldn't also say environmental law as a mandatory subject in our law curriculum. And now I would like to remind everyone to please, please uh, sign in your attendance. There's a link in the chat box, sign your attendance because you need your attendance to be registered today because for you to get a certificate from this course, you must be able to attend nine of the 12 sessions. So our only way of checking that you have been with us for nine sessions, at least nine sessions, is the attendance sheet. So kindly scroll up. There's a link there and please sign up. Next is uh, the materials. Uh, what Jonathan has presented today, you can access it by, if you go back to the first letter you receive for this program, that letter from the, that email from train the trainers team, I think that was already this, that was emailed to us as early as September 18. That's the email where you got the registration link. Now go back to that. And in that email, there's a, there's a paragraph there and it says that you can access uh, the materials for this event, all the sessions in the events app. So if you just touch, you know, go back to the email and touch that, those words, event page. You, know? you touch that and you will be brought to the page where all the materials, including the recording of this uh, activity now, the session now, You'll go there and you'll be able to get what Jonathan has shared to you a while ago. So, and then lastly, our next session will be next September 29th, still 9 a.m. And you'll again be receiving another email from us, uh, giving you instruction on how to be able to access the link for September 29th. And September 29th will be about the state of, of environmental law in the Philippines, evolution, challenges, prospects, and opportunities. And our resource speaker is attorney Griselda Mayo Anda, the founder of the Environmental Legal Assistance Center and a faculty of the Palawan State University. We will also be sending you the program for the next session. So expect it. Keep on checking your emails for updates on our training. So thank you, everyone, and God bless you all. Thank you.